Cyberwork is celebrating its next major milestone. As of July 2020, Cyberwork has had over a quarter of a million listeners. We're so grateful to all of you that have watched the videos on our YouTube page, commented on live release feeds, left ratings and reviews on your favorite podcast platform, redeemed bonus offers, or just listened in the comfort of your own home. Thank you to all of you. Because our listenership is growing so quickly and because Cyberwork has big plans for the second half of 2020 and beyond, we want to make sure that we're giving you what you want to hear. That's right, we want to hear specifically from you. So please go to www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. That's www and the numeral two, www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. The survey is just a few questions and it won't take you that long, but it will really help us to know where you are in your cybersecurity career and what topics and types of information you enjoy hearing on this podcast. Again, that's www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. Uh, please respond today and you could be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card. That's www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. Thanks once again for listening. And now on with the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Today's guest, Eric Jeffrey, is a fellow podcaster. He's the host of the Cybersecurity Graybeard podcast, which is designed to help students, early professionals, and seasoned cybersecurity specialists with career advice, as well as offering job hunting assistance and ways to advance a career. Sounds familiar. Uh, Eric has over 25 years in information technology experience, including over 20 years in cybersecurity. Uh, he created this podcast to share his own personal experience and to help others advance their career and enjoy the professional happiness based on his successes and failures. So we're going to talk today about his security journey, as well as some of the advice he dispenses on his own show. Needless to say, if you enjoy cyber work, you should absolutely be checking out Cybersecurity Graybeard as well. Eric Jeffrey has over 20 years experience in cybersecurity and currently works as a senior managing consultant and solutions architect for IBM Security. Mr. Jeffrey has extensive industry experience uh, with stints in entertainment, defense, aerospace, healthcare, and technology, among others. Eric has published numerous articles and spoken at several conferences across the U.S. and Canada. Mr. Jeffrey, as mentioned, runs podcasts under the moniker of Cybersecurity Graybeard, where he helps students and early professionals begin and grow in the cybersecurity field. Eric lives outside of Denver, Colorado with his wife and four grown children. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today on CyberWork. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, so let's uh, start by talking about your past 20 years in cybersecurity. Uh, you spent 25 total years in IT and 20 of those in cybersecurity, which means we're talking, uh, you know, 1995 to 2000 or so. So tell me about the change that happened in 2000 when you decided to move more into cybersecurity range. Sure. It's a good question. It's interesting looking back. Uh, so I was married to a U.S. Air Force officer for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And so being around uh, military folks uh, was a very interesting experience. And I moved around every few years. So when uh, we arrived at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California, I was doing some marketing work and then I got into contracting. And then I ended up at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, where I was a system administrator and I learned quite a bit about networks, systems, uh, and this is in the 97, 98 timeframe. Okay. Uh, I picked up my Microsoft certified systems engineering and I really like the networks. So networking, I think is a primary technology required if you really want to get deep into cybersecurity. Sure. So when I left the Skunk Works, I went to a, uh, a firm called Tybrin at uh, Edwards Air Force Base and I was a contractor for the 95th Com Squadron. So, uh, really just being around military and, and learning about the networks and uh, uh, it, it, one thing led to another and it was really just a, a fun journey. And when I found it, it's, it's kind of like anything else. And when you're in a candy store and you just find that perfect candy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, that's really what this was about. That's the taste I've been waiting for my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm blessed. I found it early. Nice. So, um, so how, uh, what was the cybersecurity landscape like in 2000, like tech wise or procedurally or scope wise? And how has it, how has it changed in the past 20 years? I like the question. Um, some of it is massively different and some of it is sadly the same. Okay. Uh, so back then, TCPIP was created in the, in the 70s and the 80s and even earlier than that when it really started. And it was designed to be a trusted environment. They didn't expect to have 
the breaches that ended up coming. And we sure. started seeing some serious stuff in the mid 90s and the late 90s. Uh, there weren't security operation centers back then. You had a knock and network operation center. So you had the formation of it and an idea that we needed to have people protecting an environment. And when I was at the base, you did have the security guys. There was a firewall up. That was pretty much it. I mean, cybersecurity was you have a firewall. You may have some bifurcated networks. And, uh, you know, that's it. So today, obviously, we have massive amounts of technology. I mean, leading in with machine learning and AI and cognitive and all this other cool stuff. And yet we have the same problems. We still have passwords. We still have clear text to worry about. We still have social engineering, which is a problem. Uh, it's, it's a really big problem. And one of the things that I, I was thinking about that is still an issue, I don't hear a lot about it. I think it needs to be looked at. And that's who watches the watchers. I remember back uh, when I was uh, doing some work, some of the airmen that were running the firewall, they wanted to use AOL Instant Messenger, but the base policy said no. So, well, one of the guys logged on to the firewall one firewall and he made a modification. So the squadron or the, the airmen could use AOL Instant Messenger and mm -hmm. nobody else could. And there was nobody watching them. Right. And I think that we have some issues today with some insider threats. You know, what are the policies and procedures around that? So uh, I think that uh, passwords, who watches the watchers, clear text, these are all still really substantial security concerns. And it, the passwords, and a lot of my peers, Chris Roberts in particular, has talked about this. Why are we still talking about passwords? Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. We may have MFA. We do have MFA. But I'm still, I, I'm typing in a password. And right. whether you're using KeyPass or LastPass, I don't even know my passwords, honestly. I have one main one to get into LastPass, but yep. why am I still dealing with it? You know, oh, yeah. Yeah, that. then it, it kicks out some incomprehensible gibberish that uh, is apparently yeah. safe. And then there we go. Um, that, I mean, that, that takes me back to, you know, a time, you know, I was, I was not in IT, but, you know, yeah, at the end of the 90s and into the 2000s, like there was, you, you, could, you could very easily be the only person in the office who knew what the security aspects of the company was, even if you weren't the IT person, like it just, it just kind of ran in the background. So, so do you think that there's still a lot of that sort of lack of oversight in that regard? Like there's still places that, you know, like you said, you have people who are making, have been making these, you know, these modifications to their firewall or these clutches for 20 years and they're all just still kind of sitting out there, you think? I won't quantify it by saying a lot or many or much. I will say that it is a problem. I will say okay. that there are individuals out there. I mean, even, if you look back at uh, Snowden, I just read uh, Bart and Gelman's book, uh, Dark Mirror, and even Snowden talked about it. He got into security. He was working at the desk as a security guard, and they had Mac filtering. And so he went and spoofed some Mac addresses, and he was able to go out. The network guys came in and said, how'd you do this? And why are you working as a security guard at the front desk? Do you want to work with us, the net work with us <laughs> networking? Right. So I mean, even if you look at Snowden, he was, you know, that was the beginning of his journey, if you will, to get into uh, into networking. And I think that there are issues about that. I mean, in my line of work, I, I talk to guys and I see what people are doing and you know, some of it's questionable. And, uh, you know, whether it's illegal or not, there are some unethical actions. And the thing that they said about Snowden is, geez, we couldn't get him in trouble because he was breaking out. He wasn't breaking in. Hmm. Be that as it may, you're still modifying another entity's environment for your yeah. benefit. And yeah, I, I think that companies need to you know, data loss prevention DLP is a strong technology to help with that. However, you really need to have audits and, and logs uh, reviewed at the, you know, operating level. Yeah. You need to have an operations review of the organization, I think. Yeah, and to your mind, not a lot of, not as many people as, as should are, are treating this as kind of like a number one concern. Yeah, and inside of that, there was a study put out a few years ago by Forrester, I think, that talked about 70% of the attacks were insider attacks. Everybody's worried mm -hmm. about the Chinese and the Brazilians and the, the whomever. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, I see that in, in, in my environment. I mean, I literally built a lab and I'm getting hit by Hong Kong, Japan, China, Brazil, Saudi Arabia. But truthfully, I'm kind of worried about some people that are in my environment that may be yeah. doing some privilege escalation or some lateral movement. It's not always a threat coming from the outside. So we need to be aware of that. And, you know, to your original question, these were concerns that we had back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, I remember we had a sniffer on the line and it was all clear text. They were using Telnet and I could see the medical appointments. I mean, today you didn't have HIPAA back then. It was just starting in 96, I guess. But now you have internal environments that have sniffers on the line. People are seeing the data and they're not supposed to. So there needs to be processes that are put in place. This is partly technology, but it's really more about a review and an evaluation of the people and the processes. 
that right. should be taken a look at. Yeah, because these are these are processes that, if sort of broadly implemented, would probably take you know about a week of everyone's time, right? <laughs> you know, if if we all made a concerted effort to do it, you know, uh, national get your get your security holes filled week or something like that, like you know, it seems like I, this would be a pro- uh, not stop being a problem very quickly. Yeah, and a, a big part of it, honestly, is that if people knew they were being watched and. Mm-hmm. I, it's an old Star Trek episode. Who watches the Watchers uh, right. for the other TNG geeks out there? Um, but what are the processes in place? To, do they know they're being watched? Do they yeah. know that they have to do it? And I think a lot of them realize, geez, you know what? If I want to make this modification so I can, something as simple as I'm going to modify the proxy so I can go to betting websites because it's Tuesday afternoon and I'm bored and I want to get some money down on the NBA yeah. playoffs. It's something as simple as that. People may think it's simple, but what happens when you go to that site it's a host for a botnet or it has some malware. And now because you wanted to, as the IT guy, wanted to go bet on a game, you're getting infected. You don't have yep. the processes or the technology in place. And now you put the whole environment at risk. If that individual, hypothetical individual, knew he was being audited, he probably would do it on his mobile device to find another way and not use right. the corporate machine. Yeah. Uh, so moving back to your career, what are some, some key moments in, in your career, some, like some places where you, you felt your skills level up or where you took a new job that stretched your capabilities or received some career changing advice from a mentor? That's good. I like, I like the term level up. Uh, we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. People and at a certain Trek. age, I'll, uh, a bell goes in their head when they hear level up. Yeah. Oh, uh, fair enough. I'm thinking D&D, but it may as well mm-hmm. be uh, you know, one of the online. Oh, all, all of the above. All of the above. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there were a few. Um, the, a big shift early was going to Tybrin. When I left Lockheed Martin as a sysadmin and I was just dealing with Windows boxes and then going to Tybrin, I did some really fun things. I built a, a knock for them. We installed tools, including that sniffer I mentioned. El Toro Marine Base was decommissioned and they moved the Marines to Edwards. And I was the engineer that designed and built the network. And it was actually in a hangar. And I, I thought it was cool because they brought in their um, the Chinooks and the old Vietnam helicopters. And so I'm building out this network for these Marines in, in, in this hangar. And I learned a lot about the technology. I also learned a lot about processes and people. Uh, the project manager at the uh, uh, civilian uh, agent, I learned a lot about politics in the workplace working yeah. at, at a, uh, as a government contractor because I had to deal with civilians uh, in the government. I had to deal with other contract companies and I had to deal with the military and the officers and the enlisted guys. So learning the intricacies of that was very good at a personal and a professional level, not to mention the technology. Um, I also did some remote access back then. I was working with Altiga, which I think later was acquired by Cisco um, to bring in Bell Helicopter uh, in, so they could have a a remote connection and back in the late 90s this was unusual to do it this way it was a vpn normally they would just have a t1 line or some dedicated circuit so that was that was a big level up um, going to hewlett packard i actually went to agilent and then i was outsourced and i offshored my network operations center team to malaysia um, hmm. so i learned quite a bit about offshoring and how that's different than outsourcing and okay. i also was running a you know multi-million dollar contract for uh, a vendor, so the vendor management uh, piece of it. And then I got into a lot with um, AAA access authentication and authorization with TACAX, capacity planning and performance management. So again, I just kept going down the path of networks um, over and over and seeing the way routing worked and how the telcos routed and we installed the technology. At the time it was called NetIQ and then I think it became Pegasus. And the idea was I'm sitting in Colorado Springs and it should have been about 40 milliseconds to most places. Uh, and all of a sudden I'm going 120 milliseconds to get to Portland. And I called AT&T and I'm like, what did you guys do? Well, we didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah, you did. I mean, you me down to Texas, guys. And then you put me back up there. So learning about the routing mechanisms, um, that was big. Uh, and then probably the biggest jump until I came to IBM was when I went to Quadramed, a healthcare IT company where they basically pulled me away from HP and said, listen, you're doing managed services. We have these engineers that are hardware and systems guys, and we would like them to become a revenue generating team. So rather than being a cost center, Eric, build a business around them, build services and, and basically rent them out or, or sell their services. And mm-hmm. I did that for about eight and a half years. It was just a wonderful company, great leadership. Uh, I had a couple of mentors there that, uh, as a matter of the other day, I sent um, Linda a note and just thanked her. I mean, I'm where I am today in large part because of some of the mentorship that I received at Quadramed. I mean, it wasn't all hunky dory and some of the deals that we did took literally years, but hmm. I mean, there are feathers in my cap. When I 
you know, on my deathbed in 50 years, thinking about my successes in, in, in my career, a couple of projects at Quadrant were huge. And then obviously coming to IBM. Um, IBM is, uh, it's just a great company. I mean, it's huge. And I, I've worked at Lockheed. I worked at HP and Apple, so I know big companies. But uh, I work in a, a practice that is smaller and uh, I'm given leeway. I'm allowed to give back, which is uh, something that IBM encourages. And so technologically, I've learned a lot about processes and how you can operationalize security where I have a lot of the technical knowledge. IBM has focused me on oper operations and operationalizing so I can go to our customers, which are some of the biggest names in the world, uh, and help them uh, benefit from it. So whether I'm studying one day or speaking with you or building out a lab, uh, you know, hacking from one to the other on my other machines, um, you know, what I've been able to do and the clients that I've worked with here has been a major level up for me. So I'm, I'm fortunate for that. Cool. Now, I, uh, your answers, you know, triggered as, as they should trigger another couple of questions for me here. But um, the first one I wanted to, I wanted to jump way back to you were talking about how working for Lockheed was it, I believe um, you were saying that it, uh, it gave you the skills in knowing how to sort of navigate between contractors and civilians and the military. And because a lot of uh, InfoSec students, people who are watching this show, you know, are getting their compliance and certifications to eventually work for the military or DOD or the government. Uh, could you sort of speak a little bit about the sort of navigations, interpersonal navigations between these these disparate groups? Yeah. You need to understand a person's motivations. And I'm going to make a little bit of a segue actually to a sales situation that I had when I was at Quadramed. I was responsible for bringing in revenue, but I also needed to make sure we had good margins. Were we making money on what we're selling? And I made a decision and I sold it to the executives, all the C-level people that were going to stop selling hardware. And I really upset a senior person. Hmm. And he was very angry with me. And I told him, I said, but I'm saving margin. And that's what the chief financial officer wanted. And this guy was compensated on his revenue. He didn't care how much he made on it. He cared about revenue. And what I learned there was you can't make everybody happy. And, and it was the right thing for our business and for our customers. I stand by that decision, but I probably should have known a bit better about the seller's motivation and how he would have been angry. And going back to the DOD, a civil servant has different motivations than a military officer. A military officer has different motivations than an enlisted person. And contractors have different motivations than everybody. They want to stay employed. And when you're right. working with other contractors, maybe you're a sub, maybe there's a new renewal coming up and you're competing, it gets pretty difficult. Hmm. And you run into some serious ethical problems because if people don't have the goal of the customer or you don't have an alignment of goals, you're gonna be fighting with each other. And just a real example, a civil servant may not want to get the project done too fast because then they're not going to need as many employees. And if they're judged on how many employees they have and you're going too quickly and you're being too efficient, that may cause a problem for them. Meanwhile, the military people that are controlling the budget want you to go faster because they don't want to have all these people. Right. And then you're a contractor. You don't want to upset the apple cart and then have your company get fired on the contract renewal because the civil servant that you've upset has a say in whether you get the contract renewed. So my point is this, you need to understand the motivations, realize that there will be conflict in those motivations and be honorable and be ethical and be, be communicate. I mean, be mm -hmm. communicative, let right. people know. And it's not just the, the DOD, when I was at Edwards, it was very clear. But even at IBM, when I'm helping a client, some people in the room may not want certain things. The CFO has a different motivation than a CIO. Right. And that CIO may report to the CFO. And here's a real, real issue that I run into. When you have a chief information security officer reporting to a CIO, there's a bit of a conflict of interest there. Hmm. And so I am working for the CISO, but he reports to the CIO who has maybe a different motivation, but our goal is to secure the client. I need to understand, okay, for the CISO and for the IBM contract, this is what I, I need to do. And I want to make sure the CIO is, is happy and getting what he or she needs. And so I need to realize what's happening. And that's where going to a more senior person like myself, where I have colleagues, I have mentors at IBM, and I go and say, listen, we have weekly calls um, with, with leadership and the consultants to talk about these types of things. What are the challenges on this project? And so I encourage people 
to not shy away from the conflict. You don't need to like it, but you need to understand it. And so that was a major thing that I learned uh, at, at Tyburn that has really carried through my whole 25 year career here. That's awesome. So um, you, you, you mentioned obviously several times that you, you know, you work at IBM and you really like it, but can you sort of tell me about your, your current sort of job duties with IBM? What is your, what is your day-to-day work consist of and, and what are some of your favorite parts of your job? No, that's, that's a neat question. Thank you. So I'm a little unusual in the fact that I am a people person. I can mm-hmm. sell my degrees in economics. I have been selling my whole career. Oh, and by the way, I can code, I can get into Linux, I can, you know, VPNs and write and do the tech stuff. So a lot of what I do at IBM is, and what I love to do and what I prefer to do is pre-sales solutions architecture. A seller comes to me and says, hey Eric, I have a client, these are their problems. What do we have to solve those problems? How do we do it? And so there was a project that I worked very recently, uh, really another feather in my cap. This is the biggest project I work at IBM, I love it. I won't go into too much detail, but I'll say this. It crossed between IBM Security, our global business services blockchain, and our global technical services for the cloud. So GBS, GTS, and IBM Security all brought architects to a solution where we had to have a client that is basically a broker of information between buyers and sellers. And so I was brought in as a lead architect to talk about what security components do they need? We have all kinds of security components. Did they need a security operations center? Eh, they're a little small for that. Do they need MSSP? Yes. Do they need identity and access management? Possibly. How about application and vulnerability scanning? Yeah, most likely. How are their processes on change management and patch management? So I sit in and do design thinking workshops with them and understand where they are, what they need, and then come up with the solutions. And I then coordinate with the cloud team, I know a bit about the cloud, so we need to decide, are there gonna be containers on these systems? Where are they located? How many do you need? What operating systems? How do we secure those operating systems? And then, oh, look, we have blockchain too. Well, how does the blockchain fit in? When we're talking about authentication and authorization, where do we need that at the security level versus at the blockchain level versus at the cloud level? Where is their overlap? So that is a, a massive project. It is extremely fun to work on, meet a lot of people. And it will change the world when this thing goes out. If it does happen, everybody will know exactly what I'm talking about. It is huge and it is fun. So what what do I do to make that happen? I research, I talk to peers, I sit in on meetings with the clients. I do artifact creation, architectural decisions, um, uh, raid logs, or I'll sit there and come up with architectural reference architectures just to lay out and show how things are. Um, So that's a lot of my day. I sit in on deal intakes. Um, Is this deal viable? Can we do this? I review other people's designs and help determine whether or not um, it can be done. Is there a better way to do it? Is there a cheaper way to do it? How does this solution fit in with the client? I mean, we may want to sell $10 million and if their budget's 500,000, you know, that's a disconnect and you need to to figure that out. And that's a difference between a technical guy who wants to throw everything at it and a seller who goes, hang on, we, we need to be a little bit more realistic. So, you know, my day to day at IBM is kind of juggling a lot of these things and being there to help people solve problems. Okay. Uh, so I want to jump from, you know, your, your career to sort of general talk of career, because obviously we have, you know, a, a career, uh, you know, person who's, who's, who's on podcasts is, is giving, you know, cybersecurity career advice and so forth. So I want to start with the big question that's, uh, you know, keeps coming up on every podcast. I'm sure you've asked, had asked before, but what are your thoughts on the so-called cybersecurity skills gap or talent shortage? Yeah, this is a conundrum. So like I said, I have a degree in economics. I'm mm-hmm. really big in supply and demand. And I'm sitting here going, if you really have a cybersecurity skill gap, why is it so difficult and time consuming to hire somebody? Mm-hmm. So the first thing that I would ask is this, what is your definition of a cybersecurity professional when you're talking about a skills gap? If I have a seller who is selling services that are cybersecurity, is he a cybersecurity professional? What about a project manager who is an IT project manager who is now working for a a project that I'm dealing with installing uh, Q-Radar, our SIM at a client? Is that a cybersecurity professional? Or are we talking about people that I like to say are keyboard beaters, somebody doing a vulnerability scan, somebody that is staring at eyes on glass, or somebody that is uh, doing pen testing on our red team? Right. Are those the cybersecurity professionals? So we need to figure it out. 
And I recently saw a thread on LinkedIn and a guy made a really funny point. He goes, hey, listen, people, if we're short 3 million jobs, that's 1% of the population of the United States. And statistically speaking, I'll say there's probably 150 million professionals. So really 2% of the population are going to be in information security yeah. and we're short that much. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really buy that. So for okay. people to say, well, there's statistics everywhere that are just lies, damn lies and statistics. I do not believe we have a skills gap of 3 million people in cybersecurity. With that said, I absolutely believe we have a skills gap in what I consider the true cybersecurity, the keyboard beater, the vulnerability manager, right. the eyes on glass, the yep. third shift, somebody's coming in from Asia and hitting my system and they shouldn't, and then I have to escalate it. Threat hunting, absolutely yep. there's an issue there. Sure. So yeah, I, I think we just need to understand what are we talking about with cybersecurity professionals? but there is a gap in certain areas. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that we've discussed and also that I've learned just by doing this podcast is that there's the cybersecurity, you know, is such a vast range of job types, job opportunities, and especially skills and backgrounds. You know, there's so many jobs that we've talked about like risk assessment or, uh, you know, um, you know, threat modeling or things like that, that don't need any real, keyboard beating experience necessarily. If you're a problem solver, if you can, you know, explain things to the client well, if you're a good writer, like you're, you're, you can get into the industry. And so I think maybe there's sort of also a perceptual issue of people say, well, I'd love to jump over to cybersecurity, but I don't, I don't know how to do all that computery stuff, but there's, there's so many jobs that are not, don't have anything to do with that aspect of it. Oh, hundred percent. I, I had a, a lady reach out to me. Uh, she's in Canada. She is an accountant auditor mm -hmm. and she wants to get over to cyber. And my wife actually does cybersecurity as well. She's on the risk and compliance side. And so uh, we have interesting dinner time conversation about our day at work. And I told this, this Canadian lady, it's easy. It's hopping over. It's like if you were fixing Hondas and then you go work for Toyota, right. you know what an audit is, you know what compliance is. You yeah. just may need to now learn about ISO 27001 just, instead of- You just need to know what the widget is. Yeah, right. <laughs> Same thing. So don't think, and this is great, a great point, Chris, for the audience. Don't think because you're doing something today that it doesn't correlate to cybersecurity. Right. Um, you know, I had a, a guy out here yesterday detailing my car. He's really nice, very personable. And I'm sitting here going, he could get into cybersecurity. He likes mm -hmm. people. He's good with his hands. Uh, you know, his technical acumen, I'd need to know a little bit more about it. But I could certainly find places for him to go uh, help, work in the help desk. Yeah. This is a great place to start because you see everything, find right. out what you like, what's your favorite piece of candy in the candy store. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are a lot of ways that you could jump. Heck, here's another example, nursing. Mm -hmm. When I was in Quadramed, it was a healthcare IT company. We would bring in nurses so they could help us understand the business. And then they would work on the clinical development team mm -hmm. because they would sit there and they would do quality assurance. Now that may or may not be cybersecurity, but you're finding somebody that is an expert in a field that you now need, so you bring them over to your company. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that there are a lot of ways people can bridge from one profession to another. You're a financial advisor, go work for a company that does cybersecurity and be in their finance department. Is that a cybersecurity professional? I don't know, but now you're working for a company and you could take pride in the fact that you're helping defend yeah. citizens against the tax in your financial role. So right. it's not just what you do day to day, it's who you work for that can make an impact. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, know, my last guest was uh, Amber Schroeder of of Paraben, and, and you know, his computer forensics uh, tool. And you know, she was saying one of the best people on her computer forensics team, you know, came from a psychology background, and she's so good at it because you know they need someone who can, you know, when they're when they're sifting through a hundred thousand text messages and you don't understand how a 16 year old speaks or explains themselves, you know, like that's a really valuable thing to sort of like solve this case, you know? And, uh, yeah. but those are things that I think people don't think of when they think of cybersecurity, they just think of the, uh, you know, the 24 or the CSI or the, you know, rotate the screen and all that kind of stuff, you know? So. Uh, it, it blows away. I was watching, um, I think live for your die hard the other day with mm -hmm. Bruce Wells. It was so unrealistic and so frustrating. I turned it off. Yeah. I'm like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. You don't just backspace on his 401k and zero it out. I mean, <laughs> basic accounting, you have to have a debit for a credit. I mean, let's do something a little bit better, Hollywood. Yeah. I wrote, Mr. Robot, that one was pretty good, but still looking at the command line as he's typing. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, there was one I saw. It was it was a very bad sort of like sequel to the Turbulence movies. But like you know, one person's typing at the computer, and the and the other person's looking over their shoulder and like pushing a button now and again. Like like somehow it's like, have you thought of you know, the kernels you know thing? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, so <laughs> yeah, let so, me let me conclude. Yeah. I think it's really important for people listening to understand. Hollywood is not cybersecurity. No. Uh, Chris, you just mentioned the psychology. How about mathematicians? I learned yeah. yesterday, I'm reading Hacker in the State. I forget the author. But he was telling me that the, in, in the book, he was stating, I should say, not telling me directly, that the NSA employs, I think, more mathematicians than anybody else because you're dealing with cryptography. IBM needs mathematicians. With mm -hmm. quantum computing coming and what that's going to do to cryptography, you need, we need help. So yeah. just because you can't and don't know and don't want to know and don't care about Linux and Nmap, that, that that's just a small piece of what yeah. is cybersecurity. So yeah. you know, don't let that scare you or fool you. There's a lot more to cybersecurity than most people think. Right, and yeah, I think that also is is sort of on our industry to sort of um, widen the tent and show what the the actual sort of scope of what we do is, and in, in in terms of that, because I think you know a lot of people are scared off before they even get to the gate because they they figure, well, if I haven't been you know hacking in the mainframe since I was six years old, I can't, I'm never going to make it. Yeah, you know, here, here's a really good one, and this may lead in another conversation about what you study. Um, but I have a lady that we work with, that I work with at IBM, very impressive. She's a, a young lady. I want to say she's 23. She graduated from Rutgers last year. She was in our early professional program, and they brought her over to my practice on the security, intelligence, and operations consulting. And I was on a project with her in uh, Minnesota, outside of Minnesota, in, in Minneapolis. And there was another individual, and he just graduated the same age. I think they both went through the same program. He may be, actually, I guess he's a little bit older than her. He's 25. And he went to Penn State. He has a cybersecurity degree. Her degree's in criminal justice. The client loved her. And when the contract was up, I ended up going somewhere else, and this Penn State grad went somewhere else. They wanted her to stay on for another contract. They loved her. She was criminal justice. She didn't know yeah. cyber. She right. knew people. She knew communication. Yep. She knew yeah. um, scheduling and organization and, and, and good for her. And it was wonderful that the client was able to find her and it was win for everybody. IBM is a great employee. The client now gets to utilize her and she has a criminal justice degree. So she mm -hmm. is the same as the cybersecurity guy, two years older than her out of Penn State. And she was kept on that project because she was the right person in the right place at the right time. So yeah. understand that there's a lot of that in, in life as well. Okay, well, that, that, that jumps nicely to my next question here, because, you know, we get a lot of mixed messages with regard to, uh, you know, hiring practices and cybersecurity lately. So, you know, you, 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 based on your own experience, are you finding the organizations are actually emphasizing the need for traditional education credentials, such as a BA or BS? Uh, because, you know, we hear a lot of times people say, well, uh, you know, no, we, you don't need a degree just as long as you have the passion, as long as you can show you can do the work or whatever. But there still seems to be a fair amount of kind of gatekeeping on on you know, behalf of HR and things like that. And well, if you, you know, we're just not going to show you the candidate if they don't have, you know, a classical academic degree. I mean, wh where, where do you think we stand on all this? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. And it's actually a very personal question to me. Uh, I mean, just, you said I have four grown children. They're 18 to 22. And the youngest just went off to college last week. And my oldest graduated college with a degree in 3D um, modeling and graphic design. And then my second is studying mathematics and mm -hmm. finance. And then the fourth is not going to college. He, he did not, didn't work for him. And so this is very personal to me where three of the four children going to college, went to college and the fourth one, it's not for him. And college mm -hmm. isn't for everybody. Yeah. So what, what, what my son did was uh, he went out and got his A plus and he was looking at getting into going the path that I say that people should go trade school, or, or community college, or get your certs, go to help desk. I have no issues with an 18, 19, 20 year old that was flipping burgers through high school. Great job, great way to get to know what it's like to go to work. And then when you're right. 18, 19, go join the, the, the geek squad at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at Best Buy, make 15, 17, $20 an hour and mm -hmm. help people set things up and then get started there. You don't need to go to college and, and come out with a, a bachelor's in in aerospace engineering or industrial engineering or economics or finance to go work in cybersecurity. There are fields that do need it. I think sellers should have a bachelor's degree. I think sellers should be well-rounded project management. I think if you're gonna be dealing with some of the auditing, the governance, risk and compliance, I think you need to understand more about the whole business scheme. If you're gonna be a vulnerability manager or you're gonna be an eyes on glass SOC analyst, 
why do you need to be studying and ran in, in university? Why do you need to take chemistry or biology, mm -hmm. um, deep mathematics? I, I, I mean, it's just, I don't think it's necessary. Right. I, I believe that this is a very politicized question. I think that our culture, our society over the last generation or two, it tends to snub our nose at, at folks that are uh, laborers. I can't find contractors. I can't find plumbers or HVAC repair guys. And when I find them, they're so busy, I can't get them in. Mm -hmm. Because there has become, in my opinion, um, a nose snubbing at those careers. And it's a detriment to everybody, especially the individual. Don't force somebody to go to college that wants to sit up at 2 a.m., looking at glass and seeing a tax coming in from China, going through run books and their SOAR platform to fix it. It is an honorable profession. It is an important profession. And it's, it's a good career that will pay. Yeah. So I think that organizations need to look at what it is they're looking to hire. And absolutely, like I said, some professions, if I'm going to have a cryptographer and he's going to be trying to fix the quantum computing problem, I'd like him to at least have a bachelor's in math, right? <laughs> sure. But when I got a vulnerability manager, hey, do you know Lennox? Not really, but I'd like to learn. You know, that's a start. Do you fit into the team? You know, again, back to Snowden and Barton Gelman's book, he talked about he loved working the late shift because then he could do his things when it was quiet and before he became nefarious. But, right. you know, there's something to be said about it. People want that job. People want to do that work. And we as a society should foster love for that and appreciation because we need it. We need somebody there at 2 a.m. that sees the attack come in. Don't, yeah. don't force a degree on somebody like that because you're going to burn them out and you're going to get the wrong guy or gal. Do you have any ad advice for, for if you are that person who wants to just do the work and doesn't want the degree for sort of making an end run around these kind of, um, you know, gatekeeper moves by HR and things like that? Do you, how, do, how do you sort of get your resume in hand if you don't have the, the sheepskin? Yeah, that's a good question. And again, it's personal. I mean, two of my four kids ended up doing what some of the other parents didn't want him to do. And I'm sitting here to both of them and they would tell you this today, you know, dad was there and, and I said, do what you want. It's your life. Be mm -hmm. happy. If you want to work eyes on glass, you want a pen test, you want to vulnerability manage, fine. Find a way to do it without going to college. And here's how you can do it. You can look at community colleges. We have a great one here in Colorado, uh, Rappo Community College. I helped them design their cyber program. And they brought in business and industry leaders to build business and industry leadership team to build the program, not having academics sitting down, deciding what they think is best. Go to a trade school, go to a community college that work with industry people to build the program. Usually it's two years, a lot of hands on. It's a great way to go. If you can't afford that or you don't want to do that, then study, get your A plus and then move from there to your security plus. I'm sorry, your network plus a second and then go to security plus. Yep. When you have your A plus, go work at a help desk, make 10, 12, $15 an hour and answer the phone. And when the person can't launch Microsoft Word, you tell them what the icon looks like. Some mm -hmm. of it's frustrating, some of it's fun. And yeah. you learn, and you learn about networks. and it grows, your grows your vocabulary too. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Trying yeah, to oh, explain yeah. to uh, people who are not so tech savvy, like, okay, it's the X in the corner or whatever, you know? Yeah. Huh. yeah. So help desk is a phenomenal way to start. Uh, Geek Squad or other similar things, go to your local tech stores, fix computers in the back. Um, once you have your A plus, you can do that. So I'm a big proponent, uh, and this is really what I talk about a lot on cybersecurity, Graybeard. I tell my children, and I live my life this way, be happy, do what makes you happy. And if uh, making other people happy is important to you, but you're not happy, you're gonna need to reevaluate that. If making them happy makes you happy, great, then go make them happy. But you need to understand that it, life's too short to be miserable. It's too yeah. short to be miserable if you don't like your job. It's another thing I talk about is retraining. I ran into a couple of military guys at a conference in Texas that I was speaking at and they're like, hey, we love what you said. How do we level up? How do we get to the next level? We came out of the military, what do we do now? And so I gave them similar advice to what I'm saying here, but at the very basic, 18 year old kid just graduates high school, has a little interest in computers, A plus, network plus, security plus, go to Best Buy, Geek Squad, help desk, and then go from there and find what you love to do. Yeah. So let's talk about cybersecurity graybeard a little bit. What what got you interested in hosting your own podcast and 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 sort of, you know, I, I've, I've talked about it a little bit, but you know, I've seen the episodes over there. Tell tell our listeners what they can, what what they'll hear if they go over. Yeah. So why, why did I do it? It's because I like to tell my own voice. Um, so, you know, that's, that, that's Thanks a little bit of it. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. hear myself, but anyway, go on. <laughs> so uh, it was some years ago, I was listening to Dennis Prager when I was driving around LA and he said, if you want to get into talk radio, stare on the camera, stare on the mirror and talk to yourself for three hours. If you do that, you can be on a talk show. And I've thought about that. And it's not, I don't want a talk show per se, but I do want to share and give back. And I was talking to a mentee of mine, Aula. Uh, he is 23, 24, graduating University of Buffalo, developer, wonderful kid, great mentee. And he doesn't just ask me about cyber. He doesn't ask, he asks me about everything. Should I buy a house? Right. Uh, so, and what Aula actually is why I started the podcast. He's like, Eric, you keep answering the same questions why don't you just do a podcast and answer it once and then send people to it? And I'm like, huh, that's a great idea. How, how, how do I do that? And he gave me a couple tips. And from there, I just went and looked it up. I mean, I've been running a web page on and off. For, you know, since the late nineties, I had a fantasy right. football league that I did and I was typing in HTML. So yeah. now to get back in 20 plus years later and learn, how do you do the podcast? What's an RSS feed? Where do you post it? So I get to stay fresh on some of the technology at the end of the day though, uh, and this is another thing that I've taken away from IBM and they've done a wonderful job helping me. And that is to give back. Mm-hmm. I have been blessed in my career. I have had, I mentioned Linda before, uh, Tom, uh, a senior seller at, at Quadrum, just some great people that have helped me grow and learn. And I want to give back. I want to help. Uh, and so it's a great way to do it. My listenership is is not huge. I think a lot of podcasts, you know, you know people hear about Jocko Willink getting millions and I'm like, I'll settle for a couple hundred, a few thousand. Yep. And if I can have one person one time, heck, it's fine with me. Yep. The podcast are 10 minutes. I try and keep it at 10. Sometimes I go to 12 or 15 if I'm really rambling. Yeah. Um, but the idea here was just to give back and help. I, I have some knowledge and some experience. And why should other people reinvent the wheel? I mean, learn from my pain or learn from my, my success. And uh, yeah. that, that was the whole idea. It's a way to get it out in volume. There's no money behind it. I don't make right. anything. I don't care about that. I'm not monetizing it. It's not about me. It's not about money. It's about the audience. And, and that's kind of why I did it. What I like about that too is, is you, you, your, your podcast, I mean, ours is, you know, is obviously a free flowing conversation and it happens every week, but uh, you're, you have, you very much have honed the sort of podcast as tool method where you have a 10 to 12 minute concentrated thing. The title is what you're going to learn about. You're going to learn about what you're going to do if you lose your job, if you're in an un, you know unemployed and looking for a job, if you're looking to do this one specific thing, and it's it's really good in that regard. Like, you just look through the list. Do it. Is my problem on here? Click it. Ten minutes later, I have some advice on it, which I think is uh, uh, refreshing. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, not every podcast works that way, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jocko's. I think are like four or five hours a day. I'm like, right. that's. I, I can't do that. I, I yeah. Don't too much. Yeah, and it serves a different function. Part of it is just, you know, I got to be in front of the screen all day. I just want someone else telling me something, you know? Yeah. And, and my thing, my biggest disappointment in myself for the podcast is I'm not doing it enough. And the lady that I mentioned from Canada, she sent me, I think, nine different topics done. So I'm going to start doing them every other week, really, okay. for the next few months. And I hope that people send me, you know, w- what helps them. The last two that I've done are not on cybersecurity. I'm going to be getting back to cybersecurity. And one of the topics she had suggested was, you know, how not to sabotage your career. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I really could give a lot of information on that. I have sabotaged myself <laughs> too often. And so I'm happy to do that. But the last one was on a pep talk. It's tough right now. Yeah. I wanted just to give back and let people know, hey, it's, it's bad out there. But here's some things that you can really look at and be, be, feel positive about. But yeah, the idea is, you know, cybersecurity. I and mean, then here's the technologies. Here's a pep talk. Uh, here's, the, you know, how to find a job in COVID. Um, and I'm going to get back on some of these to, to the topic, but yeah, I'll stick to the 10 minutes and I'm not going to talk to talk. I'm going to talk if I have something to say. Right. So can we talk a little bit about that? So, you know, obviously the past few months have uh, completely changed the employment landscape yet again. So what, what is the job market like right now in the age of COVID-19 uh, and, you know, who's hiring and, and how has the process changed for getting noticed or getting an interview or has it changed at all? So again, I'll, I'll be a little personal here. I think it's important to show my human side mm-hmm. uh, that I'm not just some you know keyboard beater or seller for IBM. My right. wife, as I had mentioned, she does cybersecurity. Uh, she does governance, risk, and compliance primarily, but she also does a lot with um, Agile. She has a CISSP, she has a PMP, and she has an MBA in finance. And she's been doing cyber for about nine years. She was laid off in the middle of April. Uh, she worked for a small local firm and the cybersecurity just never really took off. They're more of a VAR a hardware bar. And so she was ripped. So I have actually seen firsthand what the job market is like for a relatively seasoned cybersecurity professional with alphabet soup after her name. Right. And it's been, 
it's been tough and it's been lucrative. She has been getting interviews and she has had, she was a finalist for two positions and this is the, the real crux of it. And then they either hired internally in one case, actually three positions she was gonna get offered, two from the same company. One of them they gave to an internal person and then earlier in COVID they just pulled the rec down and the other firm had pulled the rec down. And these are both very well known, I won't mention their names, but they're very well known cybersecurity firms nationally and I think one of them is international. Um, she has an interview later today where we are hoping that that'll be her final and she'll be up and running and she'll be working as a, uh, a cybersecurity program manager for a, an international firm. So the answer to your question, just to use her as the example, the interviews are out there. People are looking, they're just scared to pull the trigger. Yeah. So what I have suggested to her and sometimes she listens and sometimes she doesn't. And that is spam the board, spam the jobs. And she said to me a number of times the last woman, she says, Eric, there's nothing else. You know, there, I, I've done all that I can, unless I want to go. And this is a key thing for, for the audience. She can do project management. She can do agile scrum and program management. She yep. can do human resource management, but she wants to do cyber. She wants to yep. do GRC or to build a program. And she said, Eric, I'm not looking at those other jobs because we don't need to. Fourth kids out of the house. We're empty nesters, man. Yep. So it, it, we're in a fortunate, blessed position where, sure. um, you know, we, we don't need her working. She wants to work. And if she does not land this position, that puts her at four months. It's going into the fall. She may open it up. And that's what I would suggest to the audience as well. Shoot for your dream. And if time enough passes, then you need to open it up and literally have more than one resume. I don't have one resume. I have, I think, five. Right. Management, technical account management, security, et cetera. And, and my wife, the same. She has a number of them. And then go out and spam it. Now, has interviewing changed? I don't think so. I, mm -hmm. I mean, you just do it over Zoom or, right. or WebEx or, or video or whatever. Yeah. Um, Onboarding might be a little different now, but that's different. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, another real example, my daughter in college, she just did an internship for a, a Manhattan Wall Street firm. She was supposed to go for a 10 week internship on, in Manhattan and they ended up making it six week virtual. And it, I found out later it was a six week job interview and, and good for her. She got the offer. And so some firms are still hiring and they're still following their process. Um, but do be aware that sometimes they'll pull the wreck at the last minute. Sometimes they will go internal. Um, and so you just, you need to spam the boards and do the same things you do without it. This is what hasn't changed, Chris, the way you get noticed. Same thing. I tell everybody I've done it. It works. First thing you do, find a job you want, apply for it. If you're submitting it online, do a word doc because the online systems can't read PDFs well, yep. and you're going to get fostered out. Right after you submit a resume, no matter where you do it, get on LinkedIn, find somebody that you know that works there or find somebody that you know that knows somebody that works there and get a warm handoff and have them run you through the system. Yeah. If you're going to just send a resume and it's going to be a black hole, it's going to be very rare that you will be contacted. So make sure you're following up. And that does not change at all with COVID. Right. Uh, so, yeah, one of the last things I want to kind of wind up with, you know, we, you, we sort of walked towards this line and I want to kind of walk over it a little bit, but, you know, you said if you're, if you're looking to sort of move into cybersecurity, you know, A+, plus, Net+, plus, Sec+, plus, work for Geek Squad, work for, you know, uh, uh, you know, a help desk or whatever, and then see what you like and see which, you know, which part of the candy store you like or whatever. Do you have any, what are some of the, you know, the next steps to your mind, you know, like, if you're, you know, in that position, like what do you, what are the next natural stepping stones in, in different directions from, from, you know, keyboard beater to a uh, theoretician? Sure. So, I mean, a natural progression is going to be a guy that's a sock analyst that he becomes tier two and then he's a threat hunter and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe he'll go off and do pen testing or vulnerability management. That is going to be, again, the keyboard beater. And I mean that affectionately. Mm -hmm. um, I do it. I love it. I was playing with Cali last week and the hours are flying by. I didn't even realize where they went. So, yeah. Um, keyboard beater is, is a term of endearment. Um, that's an easy one for a, another person. Let's say you're, let's talk about the lady I'd mentioned before the criminal justice. She comes in and now she's doing some science consulting right out of college. That individual needs to start to think in three to five years about going to work in the workforce. Because when you're 30 years old and you've been doing consulting for eight years, people are looking down the nose at you saying, how are you telling me what to do when you've right. never done it yourself? Yeah. So, yeah. Think about the fact of how your client, how your customer is perceiving you. There are so many different places to go. You can look at project management. You can look at program management. You can look at getting into marketing. We had a wonderful employee at, at IBM Security. 
she had studied marketing and she ended up becoming a marketing intern, but she wanted to get into security. I was trying to help her get over to IBM security to work in our marketing department and she ended up leaving to a competitor. So companies need to pay attention to the path of their employees and help them grow. There are a whole heck of a lot of places to go. And the easiest thing that I can say is this, follow your passion. Some people bag on that. I don't, like I said, you gotta be happy in life. And I have been winding around and the journey that you have, and I think I talked about this in my last podcast, and that is you're gonna look at where you're going and on the way you're gonna go, oh, I wanna go over here and try that. Oh, now I wanna go try this. And that's great. That's why I ended up where I am. I started in economics and I was doing marketing and going into Best Buys and teaching people about software programs. And now I work for IBM as an as a architect. Um, it was not a straight line and life right. is not a straight line. And life is not always up in good things. Not, you have downs, you have peaks and valleys. You have to ride out the valleys, find out what you love to do, find a way to make money at it. Ask people that have been there, how they got to where they are, ask for recommendations. Yesterday, I, I have a wonderful mentor, Srini, here at IBM. I'm in a little bit of a, a challenging situation and I wanted his guidance. And so, and he has another one. I mean, Srini's my mentor. He's a distinguished engineer. He has a fellow that's his, his mentor. So right. there's, we all ask for help and, and to find where you're going to go. Don't be shy about asking. Yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, I want to wrap up uh, on that. And maybe that maybe that was the answer right there. But I was going to say, is there any particular advice that, uh, you know, a mentor in the past has given you that's that stuck with you that you've used as a guiding principle that you'd want to share? There's a sentence and I've used it throughout this, this meet, this discussion, this interview. And that is, his name is Tom Dunn. He's a senior uh, VP of sales at Quadramed and he's gone on to other companies and wonderful man, great mentor, great friend. He did say something to me and he said, are you listening or are you waiting to talk? Mm. And so much of my life is I'm like this. I'm like, oh, come on, stop talking. I got something to say. I got something. No, no. Yeah. Listen to Chris. Eric, you might be able to learn something from Chris. Shut up. So that's the best advice that I've ever received. I've received a ton of advice. But for me, I need to shut up and I need to listen and not wait to talk. Right. All right. Uh, so wrapping it up today, if people want to know more about Eric Jeffrey or the Cybersecurity Graybeard podcast, where can they go online? Sure. So I swore off Twitter. I think it's a disaster. You cannot find me there. You will never find me on Twitter. Okay. Um, however, you can certainly connect me on LinkedIn okay. and you can go to my personal website. It's ericjeffrey.com. And you can also certainly go to my uh, cybergraybeard.com yep. uh, to uh, email me or just to check it out. I'm always looking for suggestions on what to talk about. I do the podcast to help others. So if I'm not talking, it's because it doesn't look like anybody needs some help. So let me know what I can do for you. And I'm happy to put together a 10 minute podcast. Marvelous. Eric, thank you so much for your time and insights today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Chris. And uh, I would like to thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search cyberwork with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have been rating and reviewing. If you could throw a five star at us or, you know, anything that you think is appropriate and uh, review, we, it really does help us to get in front of more eyes and ears. Uh, as mentioned at the very top of the show in a video, um, we want to hear from you about what you want to see more of on the show. We're looking into possibly expanding cyber work. So please go to www2, that's uh, www in the numeral 2infosecinstitutecom slash survey. Uh, and you'll find a short set of questions about your listing habits and interests. If you take the survey, you'll be eligible to win a $100 Amazon gift card. That's www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. Thank you once again to Eric Jeffrey. And thank you all again, as always, for listening and watching. We will speak to you next week.